Hi, everybody. Welcome uh, to Winsight Live. Uh, here in New York, there's about 13 inches of snow on the ground. There's a snowblower in the background, and uh, my apologies in case you can hear it. Uh, a couple of stories I'll start off with before I kick it over to Phil Lampert. Southeastern Grocers, which positioned its five-year turnaround in COVID-aided sales momentum and an opportunity to uh, launch an IPO, postponed that event late last week um, saying that they would continue to evaluate the timing for the proposed uh, offering as marketing conditions develop. Um, you know, I spoke to a couple of people in uh, the finance world and, and some consultants all over this. Uh, you know, two things happened. You know, last week there was considerable short selling activity as uh, highlighted by the GameStop uh, situation where a bunch of Reddit day traders were trying to take it to the hedge funds. Um, you know, some supermarket stocks got caught up in that as well. We saw some 52 week highs uh, early last week followed the next day by a huge uh, 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 downturns in the stock. So it's a volatile market and probably not the right week for them to launch a, an IPO. Beyond that, uh, you know, there's some indication that institutional investors just weren't ready to buy the Southeastern story quite yet, at least not at $14 to $16 per share. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that brings up the question of what kind of what's next for these guys. Uh, you know, some folks that I spoke to, Bert Flickinger, for example, thinks that they can probably try and, and get it off the ground again in a, in a matter of uh, weeks or months. Uh, maybe the price needs to be adjusted. Perhaps they're going to have to look forward to a different kind of exit for their private stockholders. Uh, you know, as such as a, a, a sale or merger makes a lot of sense. They are a lone wolf, so to speak, in, in Florida, where a lot of the, uh, uh, you know, conventional supermarket rivals do not have operations there other than Publix, which is uh, a, a monster in Florida. And, you know, we'll, we'll move on here from there to... Uh, Publix, uh, you may have seen over the weekend, the Wall Street Journal reported that the, uh, uh, the Capitol rally, which turned into a deadly riot at the U.S. Capitol uh, on, uh, in January, was uh, bankrolled uh, by an heiress from Publix. Um, <clears throat> uh, pardon me, her name I'm looking for here, uh, Julie Jenkins Fancelli, pardon me, uh, who is the daughter of Publix founder George Jenkins, uh, apparently uh, put forth $300,000 toward that rally, the lion's share of the financial support for it. Um, this uh, resulted in uh, a, a large call for boycotts of public stores and isn't the first time they've kind of gotten into trouble with regards to um, associated uh, support of political figures that uh, have been uh, polarizing at times. Now, uh, to be fair, uh, Julie is not a member of uh, the, the company in any way. She is uh, just a, a part of the family uh, which owns 20% of the company and runs a charitable foundation in George's name. Uh, Publix, uh, you know, made a statement to that effect. Uh, they've been through this kind of situation before. They supported a gubernatorial candidate in, in Florida a couple of years ago who, who raised some temperatures in the state uh, in Parkland for his support of the NRA. And they've been sort of like a lot of supermarket companies kind of rethinking all of the things that they do that are politically facing today because everything in uh, the U.S. is so charged today, Phil. Yeah, so John, um, I, I agree with your comments about Jenkins. Um, and, and I think that it's time for all supermarkets who are, who are designed to serve us all, regardless of race, color, creed, age, whatever else, uh, to really put on their thinking caps before they do stuff. Um, and to this point, and I know, Jen, we're going to talk about this in a bit, uh, but, you know, what Kroger did in Long Beach, California here um, has got to be among the stupidest things that I've seen in quite a while, uh, for, especially for Kroger, a very smart company. Um, and what they basically did is when uh, Long Beach said you've got to raise pay by $4 an hour, they decided the same day to close two stores. And uh, so what's happened is there's a couple hundred people who are now out of work. 
uh, with the closure of those stores. Lots of bad publicity for Kroger. It'll be interesting to see how they get out of this. Um, but, you know, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, also, you know, Impossible Foods made an announcement this morning that they're lowering their price of, of their ground beef product by 20%. So you could look at two ways. So Impossible Foods is saying they want to get closer to the price of beef to make the Impossible Burger more uh, accessible to everybody. So that's one take of it. The other take of it is it's not selling nearly as well as it was during the early stages of the pandemic where we couldn't get ground beef. Or maybe people are finally reading that ingredient label and seeing that it contains GMOs. And those plant-based people, uh, frankly, just don't want GMO. Uh, then the other thing that we've seen is Uber has agreed to buy alcohol delivery service Drizzly for $1.1 billion. Um, and what's interesting is, especially, and Pat talked about this last week, um, especially as restaurants are now being able to sell alcohol um, as part of their takeout or delivery, it'll be interesting to see what kind of impact this has. And also another one for Pat. And Pat, <laughs> I need your comment on this. Uh, Marco's Pizza debuts Build Your Own Pizza Bowls. It looks disgusting. Um, it, it looks like a, um, a lasagna that was done really bad. What do you think about pizza bowls, Pat? Well, I think they're, they're targeting the low carb crowd. Um, you know, there are so many people on paleo and keto diets that these are the ones who are like not wanting the crust and wanting just the bowl. And I guess, you know, it isn't as attractive as a pizza, but if you really are on a low carb diet, that's what you want. If you're on a low carb diet, don't have pizza. Jackson, um, you've got an interesting story for us um, about General Motors. Yeah, you know, more EV news coming out in the past week or so than I've seen my whole career. Uh, so on the 27th, uh, President Biden released a slew of executive orders, essentially just committing to fighting climate change, uh, rolling back some oil subsidies and uh, r rolling out some more support for uh, electric vehicle infrastructure. And then the very next day, uh, GM comes out and uh, they announce that they're gonna uh, cut cars with tailpipe emissions by 2035, which is of course huge for uh, convenience stores and supermarkets that sell fuel. Um, of course, the you know GM is also going completely carbon neutral by 2040, but the, the big thing, the big date is the 2035 for us. And, and how that's going to change our, our businesses uh, over these next 15 years. So, Jen, let's talk about hazard pay. I, uh, yeah, I'm not going to put you on the spot um, on Kroger. Is, was it a good move? Was it a bad move? But, you know, hazard pay in general is getting a lot of attention these days. Yeah, well, what was interesting was, you know, last month, as you, as you touched on, um, in certain cities in California and then in Seattle, uh, it marked the first time that it was government mandated, you know, before it was just left up to the individual grocery chains to decide if, you know, if they were going to offer hazard pay at all, and if so, how much. Um, so a number of, you know, Santa Monica, your, your hometown, um, Long Beach, you know, a couple of these towns, you know, passed the, the ordinance. Um, same thing in Seattle, it was like $5, I think, per hour pay bump in Santa Monica. $4 in Long Beach where the two Kroger stores were, the Ralph's and the Food for Less that they that they closed. Uh, and then in Seattle, it's $4. Um, and the UFCW has been, you know, sort of disseminating the information of this Brookings Institution report, which kind of basically highlights that, you know, in, given the unprecedented profits that the grocery retailers have made since the pandemic, you know, in, in most cases, not a lot of that has made it to the frontline workers. And so sort of making this case for, you know, it should be government mandated. Uh, on the flip side of that, um, PCC Markets CEO, Susie Monford wrote a letter to the mayor of, of Seattle, uh, Jenny Durkin, urging her not to sign the ordinance in Seattle and instead focus on vaccination for, for, for frontline workers. Um, and it was interesting in the, the Brookings Institution report said that the, the hazard pay was gonna focus on larger grocery chains. And that was defined as 500 employees globally or more. 
And that sounds small to me. I mean, a lot of independents, you know, have well over 500 uh, employees, including PCC Marcus, which is of course an, an indie, but um, has 1,700, I think, uh, you know, nationwide, or, you know, focused in the West, but total employees. Um, so she kind of ran through the numbers. It was a well-written letter, but making her case that, you know, really for an independent grocer, you know, this, this just isn't possible. And, and they, you know, they're, they're giving their workers $25 gift cards if they go and get vaccinated. And she would rather see them protected by, by get, you know, accelerating those vaccinations rather than a, than a pay hike. And she kind of broke down the numbers, you know, of what their profits were in 2019 and what the, you know, the, the millions that they've spent this, you know, in the last year since the pandemic on safety measures and, and, you know, pay increases for their employees earlier in the pandemic and so on. So um, yes, it will, it will be interesting to see how this, this unfolds. I've, I've reached out to Kroger for comment on the, the two stores that closed, but I've yet to hear back from them. You know, so Jen, sorry, I didn't want to, sorry. Sorry, Phil, I didn't mean to. Uh, you know, there's a couple of things here. The Jen story is really interesting, and, and this has really been a, a you know a back peak to the whole for the last ten months. Um, but you know what the retailers don't want is for somebody else to tell them what their cost structure ought to be. And you would think that the threat of of legislated pay raises would be enough to get the companies to sort of act. In some way, there's a couple of things that are complicating the Kroger situation. One, they have collectively bargained agreements with their employees in these areas that are being affected, um, which, you know, again, it, by law, I think requires that both sides agree on what, what the, they're going to be paid and the other compensation um, that, that's been going on. So that's something that, they, that needs to be thought through. Kroger, I think, from what I read, said, you know, these stores weren't doing well already. They can't probably take that extra. Uh, you know, the, the, the extra uh, hit that, that the, the employees, uh, you know, the, the costs are going to do. And you can't get, you can't listen to any, you know, uh, a supermarket executive or, or uh, analyst talk now without, without talking about the, you know, the, the absolute crucialness of, of cutting cost structures as we go forward, because all of this profit that they're getting has to go towards developing the, you know, building a better supply chain, building a, a e-commerce infrastructure and everything else. They are in a deep cost cutting mode. They were in that getting into the uh, to COVID and, 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 you know, they're, they're very determined to sort of stay there throughout the thing. So it's a very complicated issue, Phil. Yeah, it is. Um, there's no question, but the way they've handled it, I think is horrible. Uh, horrible from a PR standpoint. Uh, to your point, you know, you've got collective bargaining. You could sit down, you could talk to each other. You don't have to just, you know, randomly close two stores because you don't agree with this. And also all these people who are now out of work, um, you know, uh, it's, it's just not fair to them having gone through this for the past 10 months and really uh, putting, you know, I'm going to be dramatic here, but putting your life on the line uh, as we're seeing more supermarket workers getting infected uh, and being out. So, you know, there, there is two sides to it, no question about it, but I still think Kroger handled it wrong. But Christine, you've got a positive uh, story about Kroger on something that they're handling correctly. Yeah, actually, so um, yesterday, both Kroger and Walmart uh, came out with announcements about distribution of um, grant supporting racial equity initiatives across the country. So both Kroger and Walmart have previously announced plans to do this. Um, Kroger is distributing it to four organizations uh, in Los Angeles, New York, and Washington, DC. Um, Walmart's recipients, the initial round of recipients are uh, 16 organizations across the country. Um, different sizes of the grants, you know, obviously, um, from a couple hundred thousand dollars all the way up to Walmart's largest initial grant is $5 million. Um, both of these were announced, you know, February 1st, the first day of Black History Month. Um, notably, and March is also Women's History Month. So there's a lot of focus on really taking action on some of these racial equity and diversity initiatives that were announced by these large corporations last June in the, in the wake of civil unrest. Um, some really interesting moves, a variety of players and a variety of initiatives that are represented among these um, 
organizations that are receiving uh, these monies. Walmart, for example, is um, donating $5 million to an American Heart Association fund. They're also supporting funds um, across the country to support vaccine education and awareness um, to help get more people vaccinated, um, as well as education initiatives to build the next generation of STEM leaders, for example, and to help students um, reduce their student loan uh, debt burdens. So covering a wide variety of ground, but again, examples of announcing these broad, large initiatives last summer, you know, Walmart with the um, debut of the Walmart org um, Center for Racial Equity. It's really taking action and showing associates and communities that they are deliberately working on this, not just stating grand plans. So and if, I may, uh, if I may just interject, uh, yeah. uh, tout this uh, for, for us, uh, our cover story for January, February is devoted to DEI. And I had the opportunity to interview Donald Fan, who's the you know sort of executive representing DEI for Walmart. They are so f far ahead of the game. Um, so please, you know, read that story when it when it's posted on our website, which should be be soon. Uh, it'll be early this month. Um, but it's really incredible that the areas and you know all the levels of involvement and areas of involvement that Walmart has has uh, participated in. And, you know, Donald Fan says, you know, we're not about checking boxes. Like anybody can check boxes and say, yeah, you know, we'll make a pledge to this. They're, they're taking action. So um, really doing phenomenal work. I hope that it goes to the next step. And what I mean by that, we just did a story, I think it comes out today or tomorrow or whenever. Um, but looking at the um, new guidelines for Americans um, as it relates to eating, um, the one thing that really the dietary guidelines has not talked about um, this time around, and they never have, uh, matter of fact, is this cultural diversity issue that you know, if you look at the rates of diabetes, uh, for example, of Blacks, of Hispanics, of Asians, it's all more than white. Uh, Americans. And, you know, part of the issue is that the guidelines are are really created for white people. Uh, they're not created for cultural diversity. Um, now, this time around, what it did is it talked about infants, it talked about different age groups and how they should be eating. But frankly, um, black Americans eat very differently than white Americans do. And until we can understand that and have nutritionists um, or retail dietitians that really focus that way, um, we're not going to achieve better health outcomes. Uh, you know, the exception to that is really HEB, where most of their retail dietitians are bilingual. Uh, HEB, I don't know the exact percentage, but I think it's close to half of their customers are Latino. Uh, and they communicate with them very effectively uh, to reduce diabetes and heart disease and, and all the other ailments. So my hope is that what we can find from this is move it to the next level as it relates to how people eat. Um, so Pat, um, you- I got it. One quick Sorry. thing. I think just um, to go back to that too, um, such a huge part of that is who has access to what? If you have to, if you need to get in your car and drive 20 minutes to a grocery store, if you have a car, or if you're taking public transportation, um, the interview I did a couple of weeks ago with Mary Blackford, who's doing a phenomenal job to expand access to fresh foods in DC, she, part of that initiative was born out of, she used to have to pay $20 round trip to get to the closest, you know, Giant Eagle store. And if you are spending $80 a month just to go get your groceries on top yep. of your grocery expenses, that is huge. And one of the things that Walmart um, is targeting with, you know, with these grants is expanded access to fresh food, especially in communities of color in Atlanta and Chicago. So that access part is um, really a huge part of, you know, social determinants of health and kind of elevating um, equity of, of access and of health opportunities across the board. Yeah, that's that's great. And we need more retailers like Walmart, like Kroger, really putting uh, money into these programs and, and being able to balance um, nutrition, if you would, um, across across the nation and really understanding 
how to speak nutrition to the various groups. Um, you know, I remember probably about 25 years ago, I worked with Coca-Cola and Kroger about how their associates need to be discussing um, nutrition and health and everything else with aging baby boomers. And at that point, um, nobody had done anything like that. And it was a huge win for Kroger. Uh, now we have to go past, you know, aging baby boomers uh, to talk about aging uh, black boomers and Asian boomers and Latino boomers and, you know, just just across the whole board. Uh, so, Pat, you found a restaurant uh, that's really, you know, figured out a way uh, to thrive during the pandemic? Yeah, I did. I just want to go back um, to the other discussion for a second, because I remember when the food pyramid came out, it was probably like 20 years ago. Yep. They actually had an Asian and a Latin Latino food pyramid, but that sort of went by the wayside and it's just all one, you know, eating plan now. <laughs> so. Yeah. And, and they have, you know, uh, over the past decades, tried to do it. The government uh, tried to do it. Uh, but, you know, they, they continuously get pushback from the CPG companies. Yeah. Uh, you know, the CPG companies really don't want, um, you know, they, they don't want to have to curate different offerings for different ethnic populations. And that's part of the issue. Right. So I did an interesting story on an operator in New York City who had two fine dining restaurants right next door to each other. They were two very different concepts. One was like a high-end Japanese restaurant and the other was a fine dining French restaurant. And he, you know, through the pandemic, they were closed. Um, he couldn't afford the rent on both of them. So he was able to move both under one roof. He negotiated a deal with the landlord who was not as amenable to his demands and is paying just very little rent there and just his utilities. So he moved them both into the one space and did some renovations so that he had a really big outdoor area with heats and um, heating elements and lights. And he streamlined the menu, but he is very, very against fusion menus. So it isn't a fusion menu of Japanese and French. It's two very, you know, people can order off the same menu and order sushi as an appetizer and then get duck as a main course. And it's really um, doing very well now. Uh, people are responding very well. He was also able to streamline his purchasing. So he only has to purchase for one restaurant now. So it's not ordering tuna at one place and, you know, tuna steaks at the other. Um, and he also was able to streamline his staff just keeping the people that were really necessary to the two concepts, which is unfortunate, but he, he, he told me that he got rid of the very highly paid, you know, high salaried staff. So it's really working out and he's turning a profit at this point. So about uh, four years ago, um, here in Venice, California, uh, there was a very famous restaurant called Howe's. And Hal was actually a uh, jazz musician. And uh, they upped his rent. He was on Abbott Kinney. Uh, they upped his rent to $100,000 a month, uh, which was absurd. Um, and, and it was a beautiful, large space and so on. So what he did was something similar. He made a deal with a Mexican restaurant, which was also on Abbott Kinney, and they ran both restaurants the uh, same way that you're describing. There were two different menus, uh, but there was one kitchen, um, and, and they did that. Uh, unfortunately, even pre-pandemic, uh, they closed, uh, but I had never seen that before, so I think that's a really, really smart idea. I think it's uh, so, becoming popular too because I posted the story on Reddit on in our restaurant, um, you know, community, and people really responded saying they were doing similar things during the pandemic. So it is yeah. sort of a trend. Yeah, it, it's good. A, a lot of restaurateurs are working together more than ever before to help each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's always a good thing. Uh, so Jen, why don't you wrap us up with some good news? Absolutely. And I'm going to ask you to jump in, Phil, after I tee this up, because I know you're familiar with this story. 
But Harding's Markets uh, in Michigan, just with two stores, were able to raise over $9,000 for the Sal Salvation Army Red Kettle campaign over the holidays. And it's kind of a big deal. You know, I, I, I think we had all heard those reports that, you know, people weren't going to be out like ringing the bells this year because of COVID and, and trying to raise that money for the Salvation Army. So uh, Harding's partnered with a company called Message Wrap. And so they, they collected these donations just in two stores um, in three ways, contactless, but the, the message wrap folks help them with these, um, like an overlay on all of their uh, conveyor belts at the checkout with a QR code. So you could just scan that QR code and make a donation, or you could go online and make a donation, or you could round up at the register. Um, so kind of a cool, a cool way to, you know, Really, can, we're all getting used to the QR codes now in, in restaurants and uh, a good way to, to, to be able to make a donation. Yeah, uh, so Mo Belting um, in Grand Rapids, Michigan is really the company and they make belts uh, for check stands uh, who really pulled it all together. Um, they were the ones who, who led the effort. And what's so interesting to me, and I didn't know this before, uh, to pick up on what you said, Jen, is uh, because of the bell ringers, uh, because of COVID, a lot of bell ringers are actually retired older people um, who volunteer. So, you know, that workforce wasn't there. And a lot of the bell ringers actually get paid. So as a result of both those efforts, uh, they had to figure out a way to do it. So it's a test. Um, it looks like, uh, you know, they want to expand it nationwide to every supermarket if they can. Uh, so a lot of good news. And when you really think about raising $9,000 in a three week period uh, for the Salvation Army through supermarkets, wow, you multiply that up to every supermarket in the country, and you're looking at I don't know, $60, $70 million uh, that the Salvation Army really needs. And the other important thing about the Salvation Army is all the money that's raised stays local. It doesn't go into a national pool, and they then distribute it. So what, what was raised in Grand Rapids and in Kalamazoo stays in Grand Rapids and Kalamazoo. Uh, so thanks for sharing that, Jen. Appreciate it. Uh, so thank you all for joining us today. Again, uh, look at our archives. There's a lot of great information there on winsightgrocerybusiness.com, on restaurant business, on CSP, and on supermarketguru.com. And we'll see you back here again next Tuesday, same time, uh, same bat place. I guess I shouldn't say that. That, that just dates me. Uh, really old. So with that, have a great week, stay safe and wear a mask.